morning, everyone. I'm Heather Casca, president of the Arizona branch of the International Dyslexia Association. Um, welcome to part two of our working memory webinar with Dr. Mm -hmm. um, Mary Alt and Dr. Shelley Gray. Uh, just a couple of reminders that you will get a form to complete uh, in the next couple of days for your CEU. Um, and if you have any questions regarding that, you can just shoot us an email or put it in the chat and we'll be happy to answer those for you. So. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Gray. All right. Morning, everybody. Thanks for sharing your Saturday morning with us. Um, I'm here with my colleague, Mary Alt, and we're partners in crime when it comes to working memory. And we really hope you had a great basis from your uh, from our workshop last Saturday. I'm trying to make my screen go down. There we go. <laughs> And um, today we're going to follow up on that work that you did and the groundwork that Mary laid. So this is our research team, in case you weren't here last time. So it's a it's a group effort, the work that I'll uh, talk to you a little bit about today. And then I have references for all of the other kinds of points I'm going to make um, that you can look up yourself. And Mary provided a reference list in the slides last time. And a quick disclosure in case you weren't here, uh, Mary and I are both employed to do research. We receive federal funding from NIH to study working memory, and we don't have any other conflicts to disclose. So the overview for today is we're gonna start by answering some questions that you submitted after our last training. We're gonna do a small group discussion of the homework outcomes and questions for a chance for you to share with each other. Then we'll review strategies to support working memory during learning. And we're gonna take a look at some teachers in action and evaluate a lesson plan for uh, working memory scaffolding. Our objectives for today are for you to be able to discuss how you're already supporting working memory that comes from your homework, what did you notice about it? And then compare and contrast working memory support in the context of lessons. So the uh, first question that was right at the end of our last uh, session was working memory comes up often in RTI meetings. The school psychologists suggest memory games to improve working memory. Are there other activities? So what we can tell you about this is that there's, there is a growing body of research into uh, working memory games, especially for improving working memory, both in children and adults. However, what we notice about that is even if the children do seem to improve their working memory capacity during the games themselves, often they can't get any kind of a transfer into academic type subject. So they don't see it generalizing to the things they're trying to improve. Um, there are a couple of exceptions to that. And I have those references here if you're interested in looking at them. But what our approach is, is to think about how we can tailor interventions and instruction to children's working memory strengths and weaknesses. And we feel that this has the potential to improve learning, not just for children with working memory deficits, but probably um, all children. Another question was, how does working memory affect long-term memory and vice versa? And that's really an excellent question. So. Uh, recall that working memory is a, has small capacity. It's how much you can hold in the focus of attention, right, as you're processing information. Um, but to create new memories, it has to go through working memory before it can be stored in long-term memory. And what helps working memory is for you to recall information you've already got stored in long-term memory to uh, activate it and make it available for your uh, working memory. So it's really a good question because if working memory is um, difficult or low capacity, then it is gonna affect learning. That's why it's one of the stronger predictors of learning, not only encoding new information, but processing information um, with the help of long-term memory. That also suggests that if you don't have a lot of good um, background knowledge, for example, or phonological information stored in your long-term memory, that's going to make it more difficult for your working memory to function well, too. And one person asked, many of my students are lacking in background knowledge. Is working memory a factor in this? 
Um, it absolutely is because the way we build background knowledge is through our sensory experiences and through reading and through listening to others and for do, from doing things, actually doing things. So uh, to be able to benefit from these experiences you're having in the future, um, they need to be stored in your long-term memory so that you can recall them and uh, build on them. So it absolutely is a factor in background knowledge. Really working memory is involved in just about everything you do, perhaps not implicit learning, which is learning that's happening happening more mathematically and at an unconscious level, but Mary knows more about that. She can chime in if you have more questions. All right, and how can we support students in the classroom who have working memory issues? Excellent question. That's what we're gonna be talking about today. That's our focus for today. Okay, so first let's think about the homework that you did. Uh, we're wondering what working memory demands did you notice in your environment since our last session that you might have not noticed before after you learned a little bit about working memory? So um, if you could put an idea in the chat or if you'd like to unmute and share with the group, that would be great. What did you notice in your environment that you're more aware of now? Mary will read out from the chat or feel free to unmute yourself and say some things. Some of you so I just summarized things. some things okay. um, that were in the, the document that was online. And I noticed a trend where a lot of people talked about noticing these in everyday life types of activity. So baking, shopping, prioritizing information, your skincare routine, all these types of things that they really stood out to folks uh, with things that they were just, you know, activities of daily living, if you will. Um, and, and then we've got a, oh, sorry, go ahead, Shell. No, it's okay, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna read another one. So if you wanted to respond to that first. Yes, I think if you're a parent, even this week I was thinking about it because I've been around my grandchildren all, all this last week. We really have high expectations when we're telling kids to do X, Y, and Z, get your shoes, get this. What are we going to do today? What do you need to be ready to do today? And that really puts a heavy load on working memory, even for the very youngest children. About two or three, we expect kids to be able to pay attention and sequence things that we're asking them to do and to remember all of that. And little kids often don't, <laughs> they don't remember it all. Yeah. Go ahead, Mary. Um, a couple other folks in the chat said it made them really aware of the constant working de memory demands that happen pretty much all day, every day. And someone else chimed in that um, continual working memory demands, but they added um, about um, how much notes and drawings help them with that process. So I think that foreshadows what you're going to talk about. It does. Yes. Um, go ahead. No, you go ahead. So what I was going to say is, uh, if you were a person that had subpar working memory, um, maybe it's in the auditory domain or the phonological processing domain. So it's really hard for you all day to pay attention to what people are saying. It's a real challenge. It's a, it would be very tiring for you. Or maybe you're, uh, you have challenges in the visual spatial domain. I do. Uh, remembering where I park my car is an ongoing challenge. I take pictures of where I park sometimes, like at the airport, so I can remember it. That's a working memory support. So, um, yep, I agree with all of you. We use working memory for everyday demands. And then when we go in the classroom, we really tend to pile it on. In addition to just functioning in a classroom, the children have to learn how to do and the behavioral and the social emotional part, they have to learn the academic part too. Yeah, we've got a bunch of other great um, examples here. So some more everyday types of things, but someone pointed out that in new environments, the working memory demand gets even higher. So for example, in traveling, um, a regular morning routine feeling disrupted feels like a big demand <clears throat> on working memory. And someone else responded to that saying, yeah, that 
routines are really a big support for these types of things. Um, and another person shared that they're learning Spanish and noted that all of the things that they have to hold in memory to advance their learning, knowing the sounds, knowing to how to articulate the sounds, the pattern of sounds, the grammar, the vocabulary, it's a lot to hold in your memory at once. Um, um, hosting a meeting that involves a number of documents and people, realizing that they really need to develop a procedure to follow. So I think we're sensing a theme here with the routines. And Shelly, you're laughing probably because this resonates with I you. Do, I'm doing it right now. <laughs> um, and someone else wrote that in step eight dictation, I noticed that allowing children to tell me the letter names after they write the word is so much easier for kids than having them say the letter name before writing it. Interesting. Right? Because, mm -hmm. Yeah. And someone else shared that it's tough for folks with traumatic brain injury or intellectual struggles and totally done with too many things going on at once, uh, at one time, such as two people talking at once. Mm. Yep, I think you've hit on a key uh, support for working memory mm. function that we're not gonna talk about today, but having routines in place, teaching children routines from the very beginning, that's if that's stored in procedural memory, like we have how to drive a car stored in there, then you can rely on those long term memory about the routine. And when you get out of your routine, though, now you're creating having to create new procedural memory. So you're right. Very challenging. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for uh, for that part. And then. We're, we're going to move now for about 10 minutes into a small breakout group. And what we'd like you to discuss in here is a very brief description of what you were teaching in your lesson plan. So in the homework, we asked you to pick one of the lesson plans you were gonna be teaching, or if you were a parent, one of the routines you were gonna do with your children, what working memory demands did your lesson plan place on the learner or did your expectations at home place? And what does your small group conclude from this homework as you share with each other? So. Um, while you're in your small group, if you pick one person report back to the large group, that will be great. Welcome back, everybody. Could we start and just um, have the groups go and share? We could start with our group, Pam. Yes. So our group thinks that we noticed it was the importance of scaffolding for the students and that routine that brings with them, having the multi-sensory for them, so the visual reminders, the tactile as well. We also were discussing about how exhausting it can be just to make it through a day with so much to be learned and taught. Those were the main points that we've discussed. All right, thank you. Who else could uh, represent their group? I'll share for our group. Um, we kind of kind of piggybacking off of um, what Pamela just shared. We all kind of um, chose a task um, that really included a lot of just phonological awareness um, mm -hmm. with a lot of the students we work with and talking about the demands um, that the working memory demands in that piece alone that it takes to segment and uh, re-blend a word, especially when we're manipulating uh, phonemes. Um, and so we really, all of us kind of identified the importance of the multi-sensory support in that and how um, we can use those, like um, we talked about blocks or poppets when we're segmenting and re-blending. Um, mm -hmm. Just pull some of that um, recall back. Um, all of us kind of touched on uh, how important that multi-sensory component was for our students um, and um, using breaking it down into steps for them to help build that routine mm -hmm. as well. Right, thank you. And Shelly, in, um, in the chat, somebody pointed out, I think in reference to the kind of difficulty that's involved that all of that can look like attitudes or negative behavior. Yes. 
Yes, I think in our group, Pam was sharing how she'd been in Orton Gillingham training all week and her head hurt from trying to process all that new information. So, you know, if you're a child or a student and you're having to do that day after day, you can imagine it. Maybe you just want to escape that situation. Yeah. Kelly, what were you going to say? Um, I was just going to share that my group, we talked about working memory in both reading and math um, and talking about like phonological um, awareness in um, sight words or heart words and also in math um, with geometry or um, pre-algebra and also specifically with multiplication and division and multi-steps. And we really, um, we talked about across all these activities, we talked about the importance of routines and repetition, um, but we were just all kind of commenting and we had a lot of discussion about how students seem to see be okay in isolation with a skill, but then when they transfer that or they have to put it together, that's where they start to struggle and some scaffolding and reminders need to be put in place. Um, we were also talking about visuals and those type of aids that we have around the room or we use in our class mm -hmm. and that how sometimes if we use them too frequently or have too many visuals around the room, it could be overwhelming mm -hmm. also. So finding that balance um, of being helpful and supportive to students, but not overwhelming them. So sometimes that's a little bit difficult to juggle. Thank you. We're going to touch on that today. And it's not only having the visuals present, but it's actually teaching children how to use them. Um, that's really important to your scaffolding. Okay. Yeah. That's um, something I remember that seemed counterintuitive when I started digging into the literature on strategy use. You know, you'd think, well, strategy, that's a good thing. A strategy is something that helps you. But what it showed, and this is even for, you know, neurotypical, typically developing kids with no problems, there's always a cost that comes to using a strategy. And Sometimes, you know, the cost becomes lower once you get used to it and it can be helpful, but that it doesn't come for free. Um, and so it doesn't always work for everybody. And that was kind of a mind blowing um, <laughs> thought for me that I, th I just thought, oh, well, strategies are good. The more stuff we have, the better. So I really appreciate, Kelly, your comment there. I think that's um, important to think about. Yep, it comes with a, with a cognitive um, cognitive load. Any any thinking you're having to do. Okay, so um, we're gonna move on now. I just wanted to do a quick refresh here on uh, the kinds of working memory that uh, Mary and I and our research team has found present in uh, elementary age children. And one of our studies is now following children over time to see if these are maintained. But there's pretty good evidence in the literature that these are three solid components of working memory. So the central executive function, central executive is really in charge of allocating the resources, the cognitive resources that are being consumed in processing phonological information or visual spatial information. It has to update, responsible for updating information, new information coming in, um, binding information, which you just mentioned about, you know, it's one thing if you're focused on a single skill, but now if I have to remember another skill and bind it with the new information, that that's even more challenging. And we know that it requires attention. So um, children who have difficulty focusing attention have central executive challenges. Um, also, things that don't involve storing new information, but which are associated with uh, the central executive are think, the ability to shift attention, like from one task to another, and the ability to inhibit your responses. So shifting attention and inhibiting responses do not require memory processing, but they start, still are executive function processes. Then in the phonological loop, there are really two kinds of information. There's the phonological information, which means all about language and languages, um, all kinds of speech processing, and then also sounds. So if there are environmental sounds that are important, the phonological loop is processing those kinds of sounds. 
the, the great thing about the phonological loop is you can help remember information there if you can rehearse it. So that's what helps us remember a phone number by saying it over and over to ourselves. Rehearsal helps. Then you have the visual spatial um, sketch pad, it's often called, and we also call it focus of attention because this kind of information, the visual and spatial information and combined visual spatial does not have a rehearsal mechanism available to it. So you have to use other strategies to help support this. And one of them is to really focus your attention on it, which is tied in with the central executive. And then another one is we're gonna talk about today is to uh, use outside uh, ways to save that information in front of you so that you don't have to rely on your memory uh, to recall it. All right, so overall, when you look at the literature, um, there are three possible approaches to increasing working memory capacity or to reducing working memory load. The first one we've touched on briefly, and that is to train working memory capacity directly. So I mentioned that there's really mixed evidence about that and a lack of transfer to academic performance. It may be in the future that we do find uh, some approach that can actually increase your capacity. We do know that capacity increases as you get older. So that might be something in the future. Right now, we don't have very good evidence to support spending your time doing that. Today, we're primarily talking about the second option, which is to manage the way information and learning is presented in the learning environment. So as a teacher or a parent or a teaching assistant, um, you, are, you are in charge of this and you can do things in the learning environment itself and the way you teach uh, to support working memory. And then the third one that looks like it has some promise, Mary and I are looking into this, but we don't have time to get into it today, are teaching students their own ways to self-manage their working memory. All right, so here are some general scaffolding strategies for working memory overall, things to remember overall. And on the left of this slide, you're gonna see the references where I got this information. Um, so if you want to dig a little deeper or have a copy of it for yourself, you could uh, go to those references. So one of the studies that was really interesting I read is structuring the environment is really important. And I've worked with teachers in classrooms that were very organized visually. And I've worked in classrooms with teachers where there was everything all over the place and it wasn't categorized or organized visually. Um, also, I've worked in classrooms where the environment, environment had a lot of auditory information coming in from different categories and others that were very quiet. So thinking about your environment and what it sounds like when you, you are in that environment, what it looks like when you're in that environment are very important. And then thinking about the materials you're gonna use for your lessons Grouping the materials needed for each step together, that's a way of chunking information because you're chunking the material. And then you can also organize materials sequentially for multi-step operations. So that just takes one cognitive load off the children. Structuring the, the environment to promote uh, engagement, so making it fun and interesting, that always draws our attention. And structuring the environment to help uh, especially students have difficulty focusing their attention, being more able to do it. Teaching students to create and use visual aids like graphic organizers and mind maps to chunk information. Uh, I see, I've seen many schools that have adopted the use of graphic organizers and mind maps across grades so that children really are very good at it by about third grade. They're, they're very good at it. And then thinking about schemas. So, you know, a schema is a routine kind of learning or what do I do in this environment we were talking about earlier today with the travel. So if a child has a schema around something like um, how do we approach addition with caring and they have the routine for that, then when you teach the new information, they'll be able to link the new to the old one because they have the schema.
And then using memory aids in the environment, as we just discussed, like number lines, charts, graphs, make sure that the routines are written on the board and help the children practice using these beginning with simple aids. So at the beginning of the year, you might be introducing those things one at a time in your environment and actually practicing using that. And um, as, as a couple of people said, making sure you're not visually crowding a room so that it's more confusion than help. So here are some ideas about scaffolding executive function, working memory now, just going into this component, helping to support focused attention. So one is to reduce the environmental, visual, and auditory distractions. Some of you are probably working in an environment where the mower is going outside maybe, or maybe you have a classroom with great big windows that the, you know, the light is either too dark or too light, something you could do about. So maybe you're next door to a really loud classroom. So go in there and do a check and see when you're thinking about working memory, what you might be able to do to, uh, to reduce distractions. And then the second one is, this is another form of chunking. When you're planning out your lesson plan, plan activities that require shorter periods of sustained attention. So if you're teaching something new, maybe you, you chunk that so it's no more than four or five minutes of sustained attention, depending on the age of the child. Then the, they do something with that. Then you come back to a period of sustained attention. One thing I've seen teachers do is to use some kind of an auditory and or visual signal when it's a time for students to really pay close attention. Uh, it could be a chime. It could be, it's, it's not the same as blinking the lights, getting people to quiet down. This, this is something that you would want to purposefully teach the kids when you hear this sound or when you see this visual um, cue, please, this means get everything else out of your mind and really focus. It's kind of like mindfulness in a way, mindfulness training. And then another one I've seen teachers use is <clears throat> to do a finger snap or some other kind of auditory signal as kids are working. Maybe they're even working in small groups or maybe they're uh, in the middle of listening uh, to someone teach, but that uh, ask the children, reminds them, am I paying attention right now? Or I'm not paying attention. It's just a subtle reminder to really focus their attention. So that was executive function. Here's for phonological working memory, some ways to support it. Um, all of you mentioned about making visual representations of the information. So for young children who are just learning the alphabet and the sounds and that kind of thing, um, it can be a support, but remember that they don't. if they don't know the letters yet, um, it's not going to be much of a support until they have it. So maybe pictures are going to be what you're going to need to rely on. Um, chunking the information into small, small parts. You repeating the information, or maybe they're at a listening center where they can listen to the information, or maybe they're on a Chromebook where they're able to listen to the information, the instructions repeated. So the leader or the teacher repeating the information, very valuable. And then you can have the children repeat the information after you. And this is a great way for you to make sure that they are processing the information you want them to process. They've got the accurate information. And then you can have the children rehearse, uh, rehearse the information. So if it's, for example, if it's a math routine, you could have them rehearse it with each other um, and they can check each other on that. All right, for visual spatial information, focusing on one thing at a time, especially for new teaching and new routines is really important because remember, you cannot rehearse visual spatial information easily. So Taking it one step at a time, making sure people have that step is really important. Again, chunking the information. Have the children create a visual representation. You may already have a visual representation up, but having the children create their own can be very helpful. And for all kinds of functions, keeping the visual representation of the information available and teaching children where it is and how to use it's really a, 
a great strategy. Okay, um, any comments, or I can't see you at the moment, but anything in the chat or any questions about that information? There was a comment, though, um, that uh, from Heather that she always tries to remind teachers not just to ask a yes, no question, like, do you understand? Um, yeah. But instead, encourage the child to repeat what their job is back to them, and that uh, she encourages that as an accommodation on an IEP as well to get some of these things happening. And that's a way of rehearsing, having the children rehearse the information by having them repeat it. Yeah. Well, and I think importantly, too, you know, it's so easy for kids to just say yes when they don't understand, <laughs> right? And so then you're also making sure that they're not unintentionally practicing the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing, because this is always the big risk. If we know kids have poor working memory and we sort of send them off into the woods to do their own thing, they could actually be building incorrect memories. I think, I think too, often what we see with some of these students is even just their lack of awareness that they, they aren't understanding because sometimes they do think they have it until they start to go um, and even just kind of helping even with that initiation. Mm -hmm. Yes, anytime. <clears throat> so having them rehearse and repeat the information back to you and creating the representation themselves that you can check is a great way of checking that. So you might be saying to yourself, wait a second, this all these things that are talking about is just good teaching. And it is, it is good teaching. Um, but I think that um, it's easy to forget that some children really need very good teaching. You know, they need a lot of repetition. They need a lot of chunking. And in your classroom or in your group, you can figure that about 10 to 15% of the kids are gonna be like that, so. All right, so when you create your teaching and learning objectives uh, for a lesson plan and the steps that you're gonna use to accomplish them, Keep at the forefront of your mind the components of working memory that are required at each step that we just went over. So keep in mind what central executive skills is this child going to need, what are the phonological loop demands, and what are the visual spatial demands. So we're going to take a look at this. Uh, come on. So let's say we have a, this is an example lesson plan on the right hand side. I've got the different components of working memory because I'm providing you with a visual aid to remember what the pieces of working memory are. And um, let's say that we're going to try and teach children to identify whether the target word is a noun or a verb when you're reading sentences from a book to children. So First is a preparation for the lesson. How could you set the stage for learning by considering working memory challenges? What's really important before you even start the lesson to set the stage for learning? Go ahead and either type in the chat or um, say something, one or two things out loud and, and look at the working memory required for this particular objective. You could give them, you could have some type of visual support prepared to help because they are, may likely not remember what is a noun and what is a verb. So having a visual prepared that um, they can quickly reference once they find their target word. Yes, absolutely. You could think about executive function before you even start. You know which children need a special support to pay attention and you could help arrange, think about seating, think about the environment. Think about how much time you're going to spend on this lesson. Sometimes in preschool, we really coach preschool teachers, you know, your, your circle time should not last 50 minutes. <laughs> you're not going to get kids to be able to focus if you're trying to teach new information during that time. So I think this would be a great time to think about before I even start the lesson, how am I going to support uh, focused attention? All right, so here's my anticipatory set for the kids. Remember that in our last lesson, we learned about two kinds of words, nouns and verbs. Nouns are words that name a person, place, or thing. Verbs are words that describe an action. In our lesson today, I am going to read you sentences from our book, All About Butterflies. After I read the sentence, I will choose one word from the sentence and ask you to decide whether that word is a noun or a verb. 
That's my set. What do you think about that? What working memory is required and what could I do? And while people are thinking about that uh, in the chat, there were some other ideas too about reviewing definitions, providing visuals, have visual references in addition to the verbal reminder and engage with student interest, like a picture of a movie character or things like that. Mm -hmm. Could you bring in a kinesthetic activity like the butterfly flying and they know the butterfly is a noun, it's the thing, and the flying is the action or a, a flower blooming. So the kids might start low and they do the action, the verb of growing. And then knowing that it's the flower is a memory of a, a thing. You could so. certainly do that. And I and I think in our next, in the actual lesson, the I do part, that would be really great. I'm just, I was kind of channeling myself when I do these sets, you know, to get kids ready for learning. And often we make it, make it very uh, verbal. We do a lot of talking, but how could you scaffold the working memory? So that was all phonological information, wasn't it? It was all talking. I didn't have any pictures. So if I wanted to keep that set, I could ask the children to repeat part of what I said. I could make a visual representation as a, a lot of you pointed out. I said about eight sentences. Maybe I could chunk that information and repeat it. Or I could ask the children to repeat a key sentence back to me. So at least I could break it down into chunks and that'd be saying those really, that, those really long sentences. Also, I was mixing uh, the importance of information. Some of that information was key to remember, like what a noun is, and some of it was not key to remember. So maybe shorten it and chunk it. So here's the I do part of the lesson. And I think this is what you were saying, um, Pamela, so I said, and I do, here's our first sentence from the book, and I'm pointing to the book while I'm reading butterflies or insects. I want to know if the word butterfly is a noun or a verb, so I use my table to help me. I ask myself, is a butterfly a person, place, or thing? Yes, I think the butterfly is a thing, so I write butterfly under the noun column. So Pam, Pamela already said, I might be better off to do some kinesthetic things around that before in the I do part when I'm modeling the lesson. I made it all phon phonological, didn't I? And I also introduced one other thing. What do I introduce when I start using a table like this? I think you're talking, Karina. I'm not sure, but you were muted. Sorry, I'm talking to myself, like categorizing oh. and sorting also? Yep. Categorizing and and sorting and what else? So we're asking them to just again access that re remembering what it was. Mm -hmm. And by putting this table in here, I'm I this is typed, but I'm introducing orthography into the lesson. So now it's not just phonological information; it's visual orthographic information that they're having to tie into it. So I just. I'm thinking of this table as support, you know, but for some, and it may be for some children, but it also puts additional memory load on uh, by using a table. It's like a verbal so, sort could be different. Would like a verbal sort that way, like take that demand out and still kind of have them identify that verbally. Yep. I think you could think about that or instead of orthography, maybe I could use what someone suggested was, is pictures which wouldn't require um, the phonological support. Or maybe I could use pictures to begin with and then pair it with orthography um, so that they didn't have to rely on orthography. And Shelly, there was a question in the chat about how you're expecting students to respond to the question that you're asking them to read. What, what modality are you expecting? Yes, so in here, we were talking. So yes, I was asking the students at that part to just respond to me and tell it to me. Yeah. So in the second part of the I do, now I talk about the word sip. They're having to, they're looking at the page in the book. I'm reading along in the sentence. I pick the word sip. So they're having to process 
just that. They're having to maybe read along with me in the book if they want to. And then I'm asking them to use the table again and reminding them. And I ask the question, is the action, is an action, the, uh, does SIP describe an action? Is it an action the butterfly does? Those are pretty complex sentences for someone to process. So I'm adding to the working memory just with the complexity of how I'm talking. Maybe I could simplify and still get the same, the key information uh, across. One thing that strikes me about this too is, is going back to what you started with, with um, central exec about kind of thinking about the environment. And because the point here isn't to read the book per se, right? It's to get the information out of the now or out of the, to make a decision about a word within a sentence. One thing that seems like it might help would be to just, you know, put one sentence up on a screen or a board or whatever you're doing, extract it from the book. So, you know, even looking here, you've done that with the, the bright red for the SIP, but there's still a lot of words around that. So just reducing that um, potential interference from within the text, because that's not the point of this. It's about judging the word. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. So why bring an elephant to teach the color gray? You know, I probably think that I'm scaffolding students by showing them these senses in a book. Maybe they have pictures in the book of butterflies and we're on a theme that talks about butterflies. So I think, well, this is a great way for me to teach nouns and verbs, but I've just complicated it, haven't I, by embedding it in a book, which I think is a great thing to do, but probably not the best way to um, support kids with working memory deficits because they're having to process multiple things to get down to the noun verb distinction. So thinking carefully about your teaching activity to begin with. So how could I support this phonological or the, the visual spatial information that I'm putting in the table? So perhaps focusing on one aspect of the table, maybe I should teach a whole bunch of nouns and then a whole bunch of verbs instead of going, comparing, contrasting the nouns and verbs to each other. That would simplify the visual representation and I could uh, make sure that they're rehearsing what a noun is over and over again. That might be a better approach. Chunking information that way. Making sure that I have my table up on the board or up on the screen the whole time. And then I could have the children create a table in their notebook or on their whiteboard or on their Chromebook. Maybe I already pre-created something for them. So they are working along with me in the visual representation. All right, so how challenging is this? The we do part where we practice together. Okay, let's practice together. Here, are the, here is the sentence. Butterflies sleep at night on branches. Show me thumbs up for yes and thumbs down for no. Is the word sleep a verb? How do you know? Is the word branches a noun? How do you know? What, what load have I put on the children by wording it and doing it this way? Well, it's not just about identifying the noun of the verb. They have to be able to explain how they know that. Mm -hmm. So that's a more, compli a more complicated, it's a higher <laughs> level. It doesn't mean you shouldn't ever do that. But if, if these are some of my initial lessons on nouns and verbs, probably not. Right, in the chat, someone wrote, they need time to process one thing. Mm -hmm. And you may find out that from the feedback as the kids are doing it with you, that they, they're good to go on this. And if, if everybody in your group is good to go, then you, you can do that. All right, now that's the kids' turn to practice. Okay, now it's your turn. Here is your own copy of our noun and verb, verb table. When I read the sentence and tell you the word, you write it under the noun or verb column in your table. Are you ready? Okay, so now what have I added to everything we we're already doing? Independent, and we want them to do it on their own, right? Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. and, what are, and what are they doing now that they haven't had to do yet in the lesson? Write it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. So now we're talking about encoding, spelling, all the skills required. Do they really need to write it to get to the noun verb distinction? No, probably not. Could you do something where like if they do that, but instead of having to write the word, like maybe they can even just put a check like in the box to kind of show, you know, instead of because just in my experience, like this is where we we lose a lot of our kids is when they have to write or even copy or anything like that. So just, I think, kind of scaffolding back where they don't have to write the word. If you don't have like the picture, the visual, like that's always ideal, I think, for the younger kids, like if they can just mm -hmm. use that. But if not, then even just doing a simple check mark, you know, that would be a great like accommodation or modification to that assignment for someone. Yeah. And in the chat, someone else suggested just put a dot, right? Yeah, I saw that too. Um, that's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And somebody else suggested that um, a, a tricky part about thumbs up, thumbs down is that some kids just, you know, look around. <laughs> so having them actually like taking them from the thumbs up, thumbs down. Take, taking them to the part where they have to make their own decision, um, moves them away from that. And when you think about how much time does it take some children to write a response? And so if you think about, if, if I'm trying to teach the noun verb distinction, I'm better off to provide repeated practice of the core skill I'm trying to teach in a chunked manner and in a brief period of time because I only have so much attention. So if half of my kids have a hard time writing the word sleep, and so I'm going to really slow down the process too, aren't I? It's going to take time. I'm going to lose attention. And the kids who have um, the spelling problems and the reading problems. So here I am. I'm, I'm a classroom teacher who has been thoughtful about my lesson plan. And I've tried I've got a good, you know, I've got a good plan for how I'm going to do it, but I've incorporated a whole bunch of things into here that aren't essential and that also could really um, impact learning for the children with working memory deficits. So at this point, how could I support focused attention? We talked about it. We could, we could also, if if we're having the kids do this the things themselves during that period of time you're having them maybe work in pairs or by themselves, you could do a self-check about, are you still paying attention? You know, it, it sometimes you do have to spend time working on something. So you could do the self-check for those kids and, and planning the activity that would take a shorter period of time, that could really help too. Okay, so, um, any other comments or thoughts? I'm going to show you, we have we have enough time to look at a couple of teachers who are teaching different ages of children. And as you watch the video, I'd like you to think about what could this teacher do uh, to reduce working memory demands? Are they already doing things to do that? Or is it something that um, they could improve on? Does anybody like to say something else before we watch this video? I just think this is something that our group had talked about in the homework part, which is really being mindful about what the point of the exercise is, right? That like uh, some folks in our group had some really great ideas about switching the order of something because it facilitated things and the order wasn't as important as binding was. And by switching the order, they got much better results. And I think these examples here too about Okay, what are the parts we really need the child to do that's the, the skill? And what's something like writing down that, you know, is a great thing, but isn't central to the mission of this particular lesson? And if I was trying to teach the children to spell the word sleep, my lesson would look way different than what this lesson was about. You know, it would, it would look very different. And I think this is the beauty of working together with other teachers and instructors. And if and I know some of you are uh, special educators and reading specialists, uh, classroom teachers often, and in our own lessons, but 
you don't see this, you know, you're, you're doing a very good job of lesson planning, but you're not considering the working memory load. So you can help each other by pointing these things out. So let's see what you think about. Oh, one um, more thing though, sorry, there's a question about how does anxiety impact working memory? Yes. So anxiety is a, uh, it's a frontal lobe initiated kind of thing. It's associated with attention. High levels of stress can reduce your ability to pay attention or even your ability to want to try something. And I think your reaction to, for example, when you were saying the thumbs up, thumbs down, other children in the classroom, seeing other people understand this and I don't understand it. So high anxiety is gonna be associated with things you think you can't do or things you can't do well or not having the support you need to be successful at what you're trying to do. But other people probably have thoughts on that. Breaking things down into chunks, really, and time. You know, some children just need more time to do things, too. Okay. Let's see about this teacher. Boys and girls, today's lesson, we're going to start off with quick images. So you need to have your math notebooks out. Let's date it for September 14th. We start at Quick Images just in the beginning of this week. Remember, I'm going to show it once, five or 10 seconds, and I'm going to hide it again. So you need to really visualize what you see and draw what you see. I'll give you a few seconds. I'll show it again. I'll hide it again. Again, you're going to add to your visualization of what you see. Then I'll show it a third time and we'll talk about it. We'll talk about how we can get it to relate to math, math equations. And some people think we're going to probably have a different, different ways of viewing it. So we'll talk about that too. So are your eyes ready? Yes. Okay, here we go. First time. Let's look at it again. Your eyes ready? I don't want anybody to miss it. Can you think of an equation that might go with this? How did you know how many there were? Can you All right, so what, what is she doing with this visualization, do you think? Helping them hold on to that picture in their mind to just help them visualize that, I guess, to teach them what that word means, what it means to visualize something. Mm -hmm. what, what kind of working memory is she requiring the children to use? In the chat, we have people saying engagement, teaching them to chunk and visual spatial. Mm -hmm. So she, she is going to talk about chunking here. Can you think of why she would show it to them and then hide it and then show it and then hide it? Does that Did that focus your attention on it when you had to purposefully remember it and then hide it? Yeah, in the chat, we've got rapid recall, repetition, attention, recall, engaging, trying to build the recall. They can check their answers. Mm -hmm. So I thought a, a visualization is one of those teaching things that's kind of popular right now, teaching children to visualize information, especially in math. So I was thinking, well, she's focusing attention. She's paying attention to the central executive. I'm not sure where she's going with the lesson yet. So if I'm a child would like to know why are we doing this? Maybe I don't know, but what if I have visual spatial problems? And I, I got to see that twice, but what do you think she could do to support the visual spatial 
for children who may not get it in twice, may not, you know, two seconds may not do it. What could she do? How about giving them? <laughs> could, could the children that really need it, maybe she could give their, maybe in their notebook, they already have it written down. Um, uh, other people are talking about using different colors for the dots to potentially mm -hmm. make them more salient, reducing the visual requirement to have, giving them a context, explaining that they're going to be looking at columns of dots, leave them up <laughs> the second time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, leave it visible. So sh this lesson goes on. It's it's so going to be about grouping the math six, lesson. So I can see it even better. Okay, let's see what you got. Thumbs up if you got it exactly right. Thumbs up if you were really, really, really close and you were on your way. Because I know some. If I have poor working memory, I'm sure going to raise my hand and go, you know what? I, I don't even know if there were four dots on there or 12 dots. <laughs> but I. I think here's another example of a teacher, I think is putting a lot of effort into helping children remember this visual. And she's gonna go into all the different ways you could um, group and use that as part of her math lesson. On the other hand, she's very she's made it very difficult for children who have visual spatial working memory. There, there was no rehearsal of it, was there? There was just trying to remember, there was no permanent record of it. So. It's, it's a great approach to teaching, but it's also um, it takes us a little bit longer some challenge, with some challenges. Okay, and I'm also I... thinking about if, if the, you know, the columns as they were set up give you visual cues about how things are grouped. And I looked at that one kid who I could relate to where their columns were <laughs> going off in places. <laughs> That's how mine would look. Um, and just thinking, <laughs> because of this kind of the, the motor component, now I'm losing information that was available in the first one. And so it's kind of like, you know, asking kids to write SIP or whatever the word is. Is that really the point? Um, yeah, I, don't know. I did think maybe um, you could use some manipulatives too. Like maybe you could have your poker chips or your counting things, that might be a way. So you really have to know your kids to know that. But what she goes on to do is have the kids circle all the different ways they group the dots. Well, by the end, there are four or five colors of all these dots circled every different way and one on that same overhead. And it is visually very confusing. So um, I would, I think it's a great lesson for showing how children think but visually, it, it would be a nightmare if you have working memory problems, especially if you have trouble with the spatial part, too. Like Mary said, what circle is going around the dots? So, all right, I think we have time to watch maybe one or two more. This is a uh, writing lesson. What have you been learning about, everybody? Thank you so much. Now I'm going to do something right now. This is what happens when you work with kids that are in high school and college and they write information. We're gonna be learning how to write information. They always go back before they start writing and they review in their head and at their tables everything they know about what they're going to write about. So you're going to now do what college kids do. This is called the I review and the table review. What is it called? I review and table review. You bet. That's exactly what it's called. So I'm going to tell you what it looks like when you do the I review. You don't say a word. You're just in your head thinking. When I say stop, then I'm going to say table review. Can I show with this table? You'll stand up. Don't go behind your chairs, though. So all you stand up at this table. Just stand up in front of your chair. And you lean in like this so you're all talking together. Do you see how table review looks? Okay, take a seat. And now we're going to do I review. You now are going to do this. Put your finger on your chin. Put your thumb on your chin. That's your thinking position. I want you now to close your eyes. I like to close my eyes because it really makes me focus. 
And I want you to think about everything you know about ecosystems only to yourself. Ready? Think. Okay, table review. Stand up, tell the people at your table everything you know about ecosystems. Go. Okay, what do you think from a working memory perspective? So in the chat, we have someone said that uh, for them, this was information and sensory overload, unless this was done in steps for multiple months. For multiple months. Mm -hmm. I think she did a good job modeling for them, kind of modeling like the expectations for like the steps that they'll do. I think she supported that well that way. Mm -hmm. Oh, also incorporating their whole body movement <laughs> was good too. Just another modality. Was... Mm -hmm. I was impressed with how she was able to manipulate the classroom to get things quiet, you know, so when it was time to think, everyone was quiet. And when they were sharing, just even the thing about like leaning forward so that it's going to be a lot of noise around, but she tried to make it so that it would be a little more focused on your group. I thought those were clever. Mm -hmm. Some people felt standing up is distracting. Others note that the children repeated the information. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of teacher talk. It was improvement from the last video and that she did some demonstrating and oral um, recall. And other people liked having them stand up. Um, and some folks thought we could support the steps by writing on the board. Mm -hmm. okay. I was just going piggybacking off what Heidi said about supporting that. That's kind of was my thought too is Sometimes like taking out the verbal part with the teacher not talking as much, having something on the board where you can even just like point to the next step, because sometimes that in itself is even too distracting. Of the, Yeah, like a, it, just pictures, like putting pictures on the on the board and just being able to point to it. And so they know that what the next step is and not having to add all in all that extra verbal information. So she her instruction i agree with all the things you're saying there were some really really nice things that she did that we've already discussed what what about background knowledge the kids are going to write so she's this is all preparation for them writing um what about background knowledge while you're going like this think about everything you know about ecosystems So what do you think is going on in the heads of some of these kids? Not ecosystems. <laughs> no. yes. The beauty of it is she's making them responsible for their thinking. And it's a great set because it's bringing to the top of their mind what they know about ecosystems. But my guess is some of the kids aren't thinking anything. <laughs> And they may be the kids who are really lacking background knowledge. And she may know who those kids are in her classroom, right? Because she's been teaching this unit on the ecosystem. So uh, what could she do for the kids that she thinks may not be able to just come up with something in their mind? Is there something she could do for those kids or all kids? I think even just having pictures of like different ecosystems or if, I mean, and if maybe they did, but showing like videos or, you know, just to familiarize them with what that might be. And in the chat, there are a whole bunch of great examples, um, sentence stems, visual cues, reminders, books to reference at their table. Um, and someone did point out that for them, there's so much going on. They'd just be kind of copying what the other kids are doing. But I, one thing I will say is that having the table discussion, if you were a kid who thought about, you know, pizza during that time instead of ecosystems, the sharing part still allows you to get some information. So if you thought of nothing about ecosystems, she still set up a place where you can hear something about it that next time. Yeah, I thought that was a great follow-up step, the sharing. And actually we know from, um, language research that the this conversational sharing about books or other texts or ideas is really can really be powerful i i had a student one time we were studying the seasons and they had made watercolor drawings of a tree outside our door that had each of the seasons what the tree looked like 
And so then I asked them, now close your eyes, don't look at your paintings and tell me, what do you see in there when it looks like fall? <laughs> and so we went around the table, what do they, and he said, it's all, he said, it's just all black in there. <laughs> In his mind, it was all black, even though it was right in front of him. So it's a really good example. Sometimes it's just all black in there, and, and we have to supply the things that go in there. <laughs> okay, I think we have time for one more. Okay, here's a, a favorite kind of lesson people teach about vocabulary, and these are look like at least middle school, maybe high school students. So my first question to you is, everyone has that piece of paper that you picked up when you walked in the door? Yes, okay. So that piece of paper looks something like this. It has four words on it, just to help us learn a little bit of vocabulary. You've probably seen it before, maybe if you've had this fields. Okay, here we go. So my question right here is, trend. What's a trend? Morella, when I say trend, what do you think of when you say when you think of trend? Oh, like a line on a graph. Awesome. Like a line on a graph. What else? Jack, trend. A fad. A fad. All right. Fad. Fad. Aaron? When I say a trend, what do you think of? What is it? One, one more time. Let everyone hear you. Repetition. Repetition. Okay. Casey? Pass that to somebody. A pattern. A pattern. Absolutely, a pattern. Okay. How about some things that we find trends in? Fashion. Fashion. It's the first thing that came out in the last two classes, too. That's funny. Fashion, music, what else? Entertainment. Emotion. What do you mean by that? Yeah, because then you have the emo trend. <laughs> All right, way to, way to get in the right time, the, the year, the time zone. Um, okay, so let's think, how about this? Go ahead. Okay. So I'm going to start new with data. Here are some things that have already come out in another class that, again, I, I just can't believe that it hasn't been raised here. How about this? OK. What are your thoughts about this lesson? Let's think about the executive, the phonological, and the visual spatial. What did you see him doing to support any of those? And what do you think needs support? I think for like the executive, how he was um, like by asking them for like what, like in other examples, so, so like binding it to things that he, like the students were already familiar with to kind of make those connections. I think he did a great job with that. Mm -hmm. And in the chat, we have, he wrote the words and read the words um, and also did drawings for at least one of them. Mm -hmm. And the, the chat, we also have, he kept instruction focused on one thing at a time. And I wonder what was on the paper. Everybody picked up a piece of paper on their way in the door. So maybe it had the words written on it. I'm not sure if we watched the whole lesson, but the, that seemed like some sort of a scaffold he was providing to make sure everybody had it. And then in the chat, we have from uh, compared to the previous one, there was more student responding and less teacher talking. Mm hmm I also noticed, I think someone didn't like have a response and he, I think he said, pass it to someone else. So keeping that engagement going and like, um, kind of like what we talked about in the last video, just that more like dialogue with your peer, like I might not know, but I can learn from you. And so they, it seems like they, he's incorporated that just into his teaching. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts about his environment, the classroom environment and how it's set up? It seemed like a pretty crowded room, but the, the students were grouped by tables. 
Yeah, and then he did have the board at the front of the room. I didn't see a lot of other stuff around, so it looked like kind of a clean classroom. Do they're you just think bigger students? Yeah, they take up more just, space. <laughs> that's true. Same size room, bigger kids. Um, do you think younger children need more scaffolding than older children for working memory? If you've got working memory problems, like does this high should this high school teacher be thinking about it as much as the elementary teacher? And someone points out in the chat that there was, you know, it was less clutter on the walls, but students had their backs to the boards. Mm. Um, and I think I'm there sorry. were some earbuds. <laughs> Probably. I just think that what he was doing was scaffolding. He was kind of looking to see where their, what their experience was with the word he was trying to um, define and probably, I would assume, maybe going from there with whatever words were on the paper and whatever he was trying to, to teach would be my guess. Yes, yeah, so um, I tried to find videos of teachers who I thought were good teachers. You know, when you just look at their video, believe me, when you look online at teaching videos, you can see some really inexperienced people trying to teach lessons. But these all looked to me like they, they were prepared. Um, you know, they were engaged with their students. And even then, there are certainly things you could do to support working memory in a more important way. So that's really what. Uh, I think Mary and I are hoping that you can take away from, from the training is that there are always ways, no matter how good your lesson is, that you can improve and that you can help other people think about it and improve the, and improve the lessons that you're teaching. So just to review for ourselves um, and from Mary's talk uh, two weeks ago, we know that children with typical development can have working memory problems. Is that true or that's not true? True or not true? Children with typical development. Some of you are not declaring. <laughs> <laughs> is it true, Mary? It is true. Yes, about 8% of kids that we found and that um, really matches Lisa Archibald's work too of the swimmies, the um, specific working memory impairment in kids with otherwise typical development. So it's a pretty good chunk of kids, 8%. Mm -hmm. There's strong evidence that we can increase children's working memory capacity to improve their academic skills. Yes or no? Can we improve capacity, your actual brain power? For what That's the dream. Do? It's the dream. <laughs> So what we said is there's a little, there, there are a couple of studies that we know of that have found that you could do it and apply it to academic skills, but the majority at this time are showing maybe I can do better on a game or the actual task that I'm teaching, repetition and practice, but uh, it may not carry over, and that's our concern. All right, what's one general scaffolding strategy that you're going to take away from the training today? Could you type that in the chat? What do we got, Mary? We've got a bunch of chunking, a bunch of repetitions, visual cues, procedures, action plans, having students repeat, organization, uh, keep lessons focused, simplify, pausing, uh, using as many senses as possible practicing the procedure. So we've got a lot of a lot of good ideas here to implement. Yes, maybe we should save this chat. Heather, maybe you could save the chat and send it out to the group mm -hmm. to go along with the slides. Yeah, yeah I analyze think we can. lessons, graphic organizers. Yeah. Using visual right. smaller. Mm -hmm. Probably <laughs> most importantly, what's one action you could take on Monday? to increase your support, your own personal support you intend to provide uh, for working memory. And I would offer, you know, I, I bet lots of people do a lot of these things anyway or have been doing them, but I wonder if everyone has been as mindful about how these things you were already, you may have already been doing were supporting working memory or, or just, you know, 
basically planning for working memory. So it may not even be a huge change in what you've been doing, but might, you might be recognizing, wow, I've been supporting working memory in these kinds of ways and, and being more mindful about that across other situations. Okay, everybody had a chance to type in. What, what uh, we really hope is that what you'll take away from here is um, the intention the intention to think about working memory and to do the best you can and to help your colleagues um, and help families and parents think about these things because we think it can improve learning for all children. So we thank you so much for your time. If uh, our time is up, but if you would like to stay on um, with Mary or I for a few minutes for a question, we're happy to, and you can also email us You'll have access to the slides and our emails are on this uh, last slide. And finally, we have ongoing studies of working memory. So if this is something you're really interested in, you might like to be involved in the future in one of our studies. Also email us about that and we'll, we'll take note of it. So we'll stay on for a couple of minutes. Thank you all. It was really enjoyable listening to you and learning from you. Thank you both so much.